On September 1st, 1859, astronomer Richard Carrington discovered incredibly sized spots on the sun. They were even visible to the naked eye. After a short time, these spots turned into two huge balls, which even eclipsed the sun for a time and then disappeared. Carrington suggested that these two huge solar flares, two mega ejections occurred on the surface of our star, and he was not mistaken. 18 hours later, night became day in America, brightened by the northern lights throughout Europe and North America. Electricity suddenly cut out. Telegraph equipment burned down. Devices sparked, injuring the telegraph operators and set paper on fire. The phenomenon of that autumn night in 1859 left its mark in history as a solar superstorm, and it was called the Carrington Event, in honor of the English astronomer Carrington, who first observed a solar flare. But then, in the middle of the 19th century, electrical appliances were only coming into general use. Therefore, the loss of telegraph connection for a few days did not greatly affect people's lives. I wonder what would have happened to civilization if this magnetic superstorm happened in our time. After all, now everything from economy to defense is connected to electronics. Some experts compare the effects of a sudden solar storm with a nuclear war or giant asteroid hitting the Earth. Does humanity really live under the sword of Damocles, or is this just another science fiction story? To answer this, you first need to understand what triggers a magnetic storm. The sun is essentially a plasma ball. It has a core with a temperature reaching 23.5 million degrees Fahrenheit and pressure of more than 340 billion atmospheres. Under these conditions, thermonuclear reactions are taking place inside the sun and in the process, hydrogen is converted into helium. When that happens, energy is created, which rises from the core to the visible surface of the sun, the photosphere. Changes occur. The plasma cooling on the surface to about 10,000 degrees plunges deep into the star, while other substances rise to the top. This method of energy transfer is called convection. It is similar to water boiling in a kettle. We heat it up from below, and as the water gets hotter, it rises, cools down, and then the steam descends again to be reheated. The same principle applies to the sun. Solar plasma is an ionized substance consisting of charged particles, which means an electric current can be present. Due to its movement, a magnetic field is created, like winding an electromagnet. The magnetic field of the sun is variable, non-uniform. Periodically, its giant loops come to the surface of the star Strong magnetic fields inhibit the movement of plasma from the nucleus to the surface. It loses heat faster, resulting in sunspots, which are about 2,100 degrees cooler than the surrounding areas. Therefore, they seem dark to us, although they still emit bright light. These spots are like magnetic field tracers, local magnetic fields, and the evolution of the magnetic field is traced along them. The sun is known to experience an 11-year cycle of solar activity, although 11 years is an average period. It can vary from 8 to 14 years. In this cycle, the activity of the sun changes from minimum to maximum. The solar minimum is the quietest period in the 11-year cycle, when there are fewer sunspots, and during the maximum, the number of sunspots is greater. Their appearance provokes flares on the surface of the star, plasma emissions and shock waves, generally called solar wind. As a result, a stream of ionized particles flies away from the sun at speeds of up to 750 miles per second. Sometimes this radioactive wind blows in the direction of Earth, and then its path is blocked by a natural shield, the magnetic field of Earth. When a shock wave like that collides with the magnetosphere, the Earth's magnetic field begins to be disturbed, it vibrates, trembles. This is what is known as a magnetic storm. Magnetic storms are divided now into about five classes. The fifth and strongest class happens a couple of times each solar cycle. Storms that might make their way into history books occur once in two to three cycles. These are like strong earthquakes. There are nine-point Richter scale earthquakes. There are three-point ones, but nine points is rare. 
Such large magnetic storms are also rare. Nevertheless, we know that there has never been and never will be an earthquake which can destroy a whole continent. Similarly, there will never be magnetic storms and solar flares which can destroy everything. In fact, the Sun and Earth systems have been fairly stable for four billion years, and even such phenomenon as the Carrington event do not affect our planet's protective magnetic field in the long term. But how to explain the interruption in telegraph communication across Europe and North America? The answer is pretty simple. What is a telegraph? This is an open conductor, uninsulated, stretch for hundreds of miles, almost an ideal antenna, and enormous in size. And just as a radio receiver antenna picks up electromagnetic oscillations emitted by radio stations, the telegraph line also catches electromagnetic signals from the sun. Nowadays, there are no open wire lines. Therefore, the modern information network is much more resistant to magnetic storms. And now, in fact, the sun is approaching its minimum level of activity. And this 24th cycle is low, below average even. And therefore, it means that there are going to be very few really powerful flares. And the next cycle, the 25th, is also predicted to be low. This essentially affects the Earth climate, because there is some correlation. When the level of solar activity is low, the climate changes. Such cases have been recorded. There was a period of long-term reduction in the number of sunspots between 1645 and 1715. Rivers in Europe started to freeze back then. Heavy rains and unusually severe winters led to several harvest failures and orchards dying out in England, Scotland, northern France, and Germany. The mechanism of the solar wind's influence on the Earth's climate is rather complicated. The Earth often experiences falling streams of cosmic rays from the galaxy and charged particles arising from the explosion of supernova stars. This galactic wind is much faster than solar wind, and it has more energy. When charged particles enter the Earth's atmosphere, they help water vapors condense, which contribute to cloud compaction. But when the solar activity is high, a strong solar wind can sweep out these rays, and in such a sophisticated way, solar activity reduces cloudiness, and cloudiness affects the Earth's albedo, that is, its ability to reflect light Simply speaking, when the sun is active, the atmosphere is transparent and more heat enters it, and vice versa. When activity is lower, there are more clouds and decreasing heat fluxes. Solar flares are dangerous, not only for technology, but also for astronauts, because these are streams of accelerated radioactive particles. In 2003, consecutive flares and a stream of particles penetrated the orbit of the ISS, but fortunately missed the station. This could have led to the failure of a number of devices and life support systems, as well as radiation exposure of crew members, tens and even hundreds of times higher than the norm. In general, during periods of high solar activity, astronauts are often recommended to move to an ISS compartment with increased security. After all, radiation in space should be taken very seriously. Spacewalks are especially dangerous. If the schedule of outboard work coincides with a powerful event on the sun, then the astronaut can receive a fatal dose of radiation. For example, the Americans during moon flights between 1972 and 1976 were not fully aware of the dangers, and they miraculously dodged the radiation. In 1972, there was one of the largest outbreaks that had ever been recorded by scientists. Therefore, this is a significant issue, especially when we want to keep on flying. It is clear that even now, with the current level of technology, we can't live constantly on the moon, in interplanetary space, without any additional means of protection. Humanity is fortunate that the Earth has such a powerful and stable magnetic field. However, it is possible that solar activity can still affect us. This idea was put forward by Russian scientist Alexander Chizhevsky at the beginning of the 20th century. Since then, research in this field has been actively conducted in Russia. However, the results are contradictory. 
A number of experts argue that a person is dependent on solar weather, that solar flares cause headaches, high blood pressure, anxiety, stress. On the other hand, during the years of the solar maximum, humanity lives under moderate and severe storms up to 50% of the time. And in 75 years of life, the average person lives through a total of 2,250 storms. Actually, if you look at the energy contribution, deviations, anomalies of solar activity, this is an insignificant part of what the sun produces. Totally insignificant. And organisms have become accustomed to this during evolution. Yeah, you and I have developed a mechanism to adapt to increased radiation. We tan in the sun. Our bodies immediately begin to respond to increased radiation. Simply put, minor changes to solar activity are not dangerous for us. Indeed, magnetic storms have no direct impact on human life, but on the other hand, under their influence, changes occur in the environment. For example, atmospheric pressure, and naturally, the human body reacts to them. There are statistics which claim that during large magnetic storms, the number of heart attacks and strokes increases by about 20%. Perhaps in the near future, mankind will learn to predict space weather down to the minute. Without this, the further development of astronautics, the study and colonization of other planets of the solar system is simply impossible. My name is Vladimir Surdin. See you next time on A Guide to the Universe.